You are listening to the Justice in Heels podcast with me, your host, Danielle Hayward. Join me as I discuss interesting legal topics with inspiring female legal professionals who paved the way for the rest of us. A warm welcome to the very first episode of the Justice in Heels podcast. Today, we have Alette from Alette Ace Attorneys with us on the podcast. Alette, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's a big honor being here. Fantastic. So can you tell our listeners, in a nutshell, who is Alette? <laughs> in a nutshell, yes, I'm going to do my best, Danielle. Um, my name is Alette. My surname is Ace. I started my own practice eight years ago. Um, I studied BCom Law, LLB at the University of Pretoria, did my articles, and then started practicing for my own account not long after that. In my free time, I like to exercise. I'm quite an avid runner. I never used to be, but it clears my mind these days. I've got a very cute little rescue dog that keeps me busy as well. I like to cook. I bought my first property last year that I'm trying to do some renovations at home. I've got a little garden these days. I'm doing all the adult things. Um, I'm, I'm also actually a very keen choir singer I used to be a member of choirs all my life and I went to a beautiful choir concert last night that actually really tempted me to start singing again but I don't know where I'm going to get the time so actually I'm a very um yeah I'm a I'm a a choir nerd as well so that's also something about me that very few people know um yes and other than that law law all the way takes up all of my time almost all of my time yeah Okay, well, congratulations on buying your first property. I think it's amazing. Like, I think that's uh, something that we all uh, want to tick off our lists when we become <laughs> adults. And yes. it's yes. really fascinating to hear that you have passions outside of law. And it makes me so happy because I think there's this misconception that um, lawyers spend like 24 hours a day at their firms and that they do not have a work-life balance. And I think a work-life balance is so important, especially when you are in a profession um, like law. Yes, absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I'm, I try to be very disciplined, especially during the week. So to really fit in things other than law, like I need to walk my dog. He doesn't give me off. So that takes one hour out of each day. And things like if you enjoy cooking, fit it in you'll have to squeeze it in there's no other way so you're quite right it isn't just law no definitely not I agree with that okay so today we are discussing a very interesting topic which is the case of car Michael Brown versus Liquid Telecommunication Pty Limited that I led was involved with a while ago so in this case The employee was employed in an executive role for a term of five years Um, She was, however, told that her position had become redundant. So accordingly, she brought a claim for damages due to this premature termination of the fixed term contract. But it took a very interesting turn. um, I will let you tell us what happened further. Okay, (laughs) wonderful. So I'm not allowed, unfortunately, to speak about the end product, which is the settlement itself, but I can tell you everything else up to that point. So... Two technical points were raised in this matter, which is interesting because it's not something you see in labor matters all that often. It's something you would see in in commercial high court matters, but not in labor court as such. So the two technical points were firstly that an exception was, was raised in respect of her statement of claim, putting out her claim or claims, more than one actually, saying that she didn't properly, or we as the legal people representing her, didn't properly plead her case. So that was the first technical aspect that actually became an interlocutory fight in this matter. Um, And I'll tell you more about that now. And then the other subheading under technical points is that they at some point after the exception round filed a subpoena to try and subpoena our client to dis- disclose to them very personal tax returns that actually had nothing to do with with this with this d- dispute so um I, i'm not quite sure what the strategy was but 
it put a lot of pressure on her personally to to think that in a public open court such as the labor court of johannesburg that her tax returns for x amount of years would have to be disclosed and so we basically fought both of these technical points and we we ended up being very proud of both in the sense that they were both re, re reported as cases that others would actually have to refer to and thereby becoming legal precedent so to speak we had no idea that it would it would be such a big deal but maybe because these technical things are not raised all that often in labor court both judges felt let's make a point of these judgments and let's send out a clear signal to litigants in the labor court to say do not unnecessarily pick technical fights to try and get away from the main point which is the claim stick to the merits except if you have a bona fide technical claim which it wasn't the the, the, the case so both the exception and the subpoena were argued full-blown opposed motions in labor court council argued it out there were heads of argument filed there was a very steamy um, volatile fight which is always exciting for a lawyer less exciting for the client and we were very proud of of the of the outcome in both courts and neither judge made a secret of what they thought of the tactics of the employer in this case and uh, i would say that they made it very clear that this is this is not what what the labor court wants you know so if if you if you're going to, you're going to try and out litigate the other party rather don't <laughs> so yeah so we 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 had two reportable judgments as i said we won both rounds with costs and on the first day of the trial of the actual main claim we settled and and so it's very interesting how you know unnecessarily so all these technical fights ended up becoming a trial which was just settled on the very very first day so i, I found this experience extremely interesting and um, yes, and the council that assisted me, which is a, a very good labor law council, taught me a lot. It was a big honor working with him as well because he's, he's very well versed in labor law. So the little bit that I, I really did not know at all, I could obviously learn. But I must say, procedural law in general is something I also enjoyed at varsity. People find this very strange. And <laughs> procedural law is the same whether you're in labor court, magistrate's court, high court, and that's exactly what this was. An exception is an exception. Whether you file it in the Bramfontein labor court or in Johannesburg high court or wherever, and this is the stance that both judges took, is to say, you're not going to abuse the court system and court rules to try and do something else. If there are no grounds to take exception, we're not going to grant it. And that was basically so. It did take a very interesting turn, as you rightly described it, and um, it was extremely exhausting at the time because we were really inundated with technical arguments, first in letters, and then it escalated into two separate fights within this bigger fight, and it taught me a lot in terms of endurance and really keeping focus while you are in a very difficult case such as that. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, so let's yes. just circle back for the laymen who are listening to this. What yes. is exception? Okay, so when you file a claim in law, so it doesn't matter which forum or which court you are in, the party that receives your claim must at least know what the claim is. So in law, there must be certain basic elements in terms of how you describe your claim. If you fall short of that, and if in terms of technical law, the party receiving your claim is unable to actually answer there to because they don't know how you jumped from A to B in your claim, or how is it their fault, for example, or how were the damages incurred by them, then they can raise an exception and say that based on the written document setting out your claim, they cannot answer it to because they cannot understand what the claim is actually all about in terms of law. So, and I think, to be honest with you, exceptions succeed very rarely because most attorneys and advocates have a good enough knowledge of a certain claim to at least put out the basic elements of it. You must be, you know, really 
a little bit sleepy to leave out an entire part of a claim for it to be so bad that an exception is going to be granted. So in my humble opinion, it doesn't succeed all that often. It is more often than not abused to incur additional costs, to force the claimant to reconsider the entire claim because they're not in the mood to fight all these technical points. But so that is an exception. And um, an exception is, in other words, filed in response to a claim, whether it is in labor law and civil law that someone may receive, yes. So it's definitely also used as a manipulation tactic almost by some I, I actually honestly think so. Um, <laughs> and if you read a textbook on law, the way that they describe um, the, the process of an exception, for example, or, or a subpoena is, is very clear cut. But in practice, more often than not, those technical fights, and we sometimes also refer to them as inter interlocutory fights, in other words, fights within fights, um, are abused. It's a it's an abuse of the court system to try and frustrate the other party because it becomes expensive. So now you have three fights where you only had one. And at some point, the claimant or the plaintiff, they have different names in different courts, have to consider, is this worthwhile? Am I going to push on with the main fight or am I going to withdraw because the legal costs incurred are just that high? So this is where it becomes a very important discussion between legal team and client to say, how, what are we going to do from our side to try and help the client to push on, but at the same time still be compensated for our time? So I've had very interesting experiences in practice where I believe so strongly in the case that I'm willing to, you know, maybe cut on costs or to say, let's not even, let's not even charge on normal fees or tariffs for this interlocutory fight because I know we're going to win the, the main fight. So that that those those discussions become very interesting between attorney, advocate and client as well. But um I definitely think it's abused as a tool, yes, to intimidate um and to try and put off that claim and to the extent that they say, okay, leave it. I'm not going to actually carry on with this. I want to say two things um, about this. So firstly, it's amazing to hear that uh, attorneys are, again, actually humans who care. Because again, I think there's this misconception <laughs> that attorneys only care about money and fees and yeah, winning, yes. basically. And it's, yes, it's yes. not like that all the time. Like attorneys really no. care about people or some attorneys care about people. Yes, so yes. again, yes. very glad to hear that. And secondly, um, I think this is something that happens a lot. I think not even in courts the entire time, but let's say, for example, even like uh, other unfair dismissal cases or CCMA cases, there will always be yes, this yes. unfair power distribution between the where, uh, the employer and the employee. Yes, absolutely. Um. Yes, attorneys are human. And you know what? I'm very fortunate in that I've got a large network of colleagues where I practice in this area of uh, advocates and attorneys that are wonderful people. They are inherently honest people with integrity, with mostly with families or whatever. And they care about a lot more than fees. I can promise you that we more often than not accommodate the client or we do not charge nearly what we could or whatever so there's there's definitely a strong sense of you working with another person so law is is human based and then particularly things like labor law and family law uh, are even more human based because you work with disputes that that actually arise from like people's lives human, yes yes and it's you know, it's not like working in medicine, for instance, where you are in a lab. You don't work with a human being or with emotions of a human being, but law is very much plugged into that. So, yes, yeah, so that's very true. And it is a misconception. And you get attorneys and you get attorneys, you know. So one, one must decide who works for you, or who's, who's your right fit as a client. And then in terms of CCMA cases, I think you make a very, very good point. The entire way that these these matters are presented to the CCMA and the way that they that the employers often, not always, but often lead these cases is meant to intimidate. So I would, for example, often when I get to any CCMA, 
the first thing I do is see where my colleague is and I go to them if I don't know them yet and I greet them. It's just something you are taught very early on when you start practicing. And a lot of the times they would refuse to greet me back. So I thought to myself, what is this? Um, and then my more senior colleagues, when they maybe are they with me like counsel or whatever, would say to me, I let it's all part of the intimidation of 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 the um of this unequal bargaining position between employee and employer. And it's it's part of that. It has no legal relevance. It's not on record, for instance. But what it does is it's supposed to make you uneasy so that you're not as comfortable and confident when you do go into the hearing or when you go into the arbitration. So it's important to to not let that get to you if you act for the for the smaller party or the less wealthy party, whatever the case may be, and to say, okay, let's get down to it. What do the facts say? What do the laws say? Here's our here's our here's our case. Here's our witness, here's the cross-examination, whatever it may be. Because those things can get to you. You know, if someone is openly rude to you, it, it can feel a bit, ugh, you know, it uh, could put you off your gun a little bit, to be very honest. So one needs to work on yourself and have that self-talk to say, that's okay, it's their style, not my style. Um, it's part of this game. There's a lot of game in, in, in court cases, in litigation. Unfortunately, once again, it's not something I enjoy at all, but it is there. And um, one needs to actually deal with that constantly, actually, to be honest, y'all. Yeah. No, definitely. Okay, so let's just circle back. So in this case, um, the agreement was oral. It was not written at all. So for whatever reason, if somebody decides to not conclude a written agreement, what advice would you give them to protect themselves when yes, concluding yes. an oral agreement? That's an excellent question because, um, and there is a misconception. So I think we should possibly start here. This is a good place to start. And I see it very often. People are under the impression if an agreement is oral, that it's not binding or not as effective and binding. And that's in general, obviously wrong. So mm -hmm. we have exceptions where if you sell immovable property, it must be in writing. If not, it's not binding. But those are exceptions. Even a car that you sell, anything that you do, uh, very often we are seeing doing quite a bit of family law is people decide to split up, for instance, and they have some sort of a discussion. And then the one party would undertake often verbally to the other while they're drinking coffee or whatever. Don't worry, I'm going to move out, but I'll make sure that I pay the following things, but they don't put it in writing. And very often it then, you know, goes a bit south, to be honest, and a fight escalates and there's a dispute. And then the party denies that they ever said that but the long and the short is a verbal contract is nine out of ten times binding and effective and you can rely on it going forward a good tip i would give someone is if you sense that a dispute is going to come of it for example you are in the process of separation or you can feel with your employer or employee something is not quite right and it feels like you know you, you can sense it almost there's an instinct that says to you this might go to the this dispute end of things, it would be valuable to reduce the terms of what you said verbally to writing, even if it's very informal, even if it's a WhatsApp message, to just say, dear so-and-so, thank you for the, for the discussion this evening. I just want to con con confirm you undertook that you would pay for the following after you've moved out and to specify those terms. Because what you end up having with verbal contracts, I have one here, for example, that's an un, unjustified enrichment claim based on a verbal contract, is you have a he said, she said. So it's two opposing versions and the poor court listening to this sits with two divergent versions and needs to, to, to determine who's lying. And it's not a nice job because you could also make a mistake, isn't it? So to just have some sort of a breadcrumb to say, you mark a milestone in time between two people after a verbal agreement or a verbal undertaking and to reduce that even informally to a WhatsApp, it works wonders. I have relied on WhatsApps and emails more often than you would ever believe to actually push a case over the over the edge. It's not a fancy contract. It's not written by an, an attorney or an advocate. It's not registered at the deeds office. None of that. It's literally a WhatsApp between two people where one person said to the other, 
here is just confirming this is what we discussed this is what you said this is what i said this is my end of the deal this is your end of the deal thank you very much i'm glad we could actually discuss this now why would someone write that if it wasn't true so already there's a truth component there's a credibility component to this verbal contract that should this go south we can look at this later on and then quote that or use the screenshot in the court papers or whatever it may be um but with big things in your life like possibly purchasing motor vehicles marriages these types of things it is obviously preferable to have a lawyer involved you know if they just draw up a one or a two pager it need not be a very ex expensive contract it could make a parenting plans another example yes exactly people and and where that helps a lot is where people are not actually married because now they don't have the benefit of a divorce to guide them and give them instructions. So they have all these questions about contact and maintenance. They share a child or more than one child. Now, what do we do? You're quite right. We use the structure of this parenting plan that's in writing to just reduce what's already agreed to writing. And then we have that made in order of the children's court and suddenly everyone has certainty. Suddenly, a lot of the fights stop happening because I know what I need to do. The other person knows what they need to do. And um, yeah, and that assists greatly. Um, obviously, verbal contracts are, are not the favorite thing of any practicing attorney or advocate because we struggle to prove them. <laughs> and they prove challenging. They are binding, again, and they are effective. They're just difficult to work with in practice because how do we prove this happened if there's no recording, if there's no written un undertaking from from anyone so please if you do important things and you decide important things with another person whether it be a business partner or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever put it in a whatsapp just do that and just the same evening or the same day just refer to it and so sort of bullet or number what terms of that discussion were it could really help a lot after definitely like it will literally take you five to ten minutes and it could literally save you so much drama by just having that exactly. in writing. And I also Precisely. want to say it's quite interesting that we live in a digital era now and you can actually just like type something on WhatsApp for someone and it can actually count as proof. That's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I as, a, as a general rule these days, when I see a brand new client, the first thing I ask them is export your, your WhatsApp chat with the other party and print it out and then to go through that and most of the um ad advocates that i work with want to see exactly the same so that we can for ourselves see if there was offer and acceptance for instance or if there's evidence of some sorts or so that's very telling of the legal movement between two parties and we are oh, you quite right it means a lot uh, to have a whatsapp discussion or an email discussion um is very important people must not underestimate that it's not only lawyers that can draft documents that are that are binding you know it, that's a very big mis, misconception so it takes five minutes as you say and it can help going forward so if it goes south and there's a dispute we obviously don't want that we never want people to fight but this is what happens then we can say why would i have written that on that day if it didn't happen because it did happen so there's that there's that on a balance of probabilities one can assume a reasonable person or reasonable judge can assume it did happen. That's why that was put in that WhatsApp message. So it helps tremendously actually. Yeah. Okay, so back to the case. When we actually chatted on email about this case, you mentioned that there's something philosophical about what happened in that case. Can you tell us more <laughs> about what you mean by that? Yes, and if I may, um, I underestimated legal philosophy greatly when I studied, and I think it's a bit of an irritating module when you yes. uh, when you're an undergraduate student. Because you <laughs> I can agree with grasp. that. Do you agree with that? You cannot quite grasp what they want of you, right? So it's yeah. it's like a different genre. You you're busy with jazz all the time, and now suddenly you need to write this rock song, and you don't know how to <laughs> quite do it. it. Yeah, exactly. It's still music, but what are we doing here, right? So I. Now that I'm older and I've practiced for quite some time, I see that almost all the problems that we encounter in law or in courts or in litigation, call it what you like, have a philosophical and social backdrop. There's always something to say for control or power or 
um, a background or a benefit or a disadvantage that is social in nature or philosophical in nature that is there. Now, we don't always have the time to analyze every single fact complex and to go look at it. But in this case, it jumped on me because of the, the clear, unequal bargaining uh, um, stance that both of them were in employer versus employee. Uh, David Goliath, it literally was like that, both in the funds that the two parties had available to, to fight in terms of this court case, as well as we did not receive basic respect and basic human dignity as a legal team and as a party because the other party frankly felt we were not in, in title to it. It was such a small event in the employer's life and such a big event in the employee's life, this whole case, that we didn't even get the time of day to, to get basic respect. And there's something philosophical about that to me. There's something to say, um, and also to a lot of attorneys and advocates that have small practices, to say, if you just stick to the law and you do what you know is right, you could actually end up in brackets beating the the actual bully. It really works. I, you know, and I thought when I was studying, it's not going to work, <laughs> but it works. Um, it worked here and it works in a lot of other cases that I do. So... If you can just stick to that and stay in your lane and, and do your thing as you know is right in law, all the other side games, all the, the philosophical bullying tactics and all those things don't really matter in the end. The judge isn't even going to know about it. It's happening behind the scenes, really. So it just mustn't get to you and creep in and cause self-doubt at either the client or the legal team because then you are in great trouble. Then you're going to start doubting the entire movement and the you know all the work that you've done up to that stage but um yeah you know, there's something to say about the philosophical backdrop and emotional backdrop to many cases that 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 end up in courts and and how people sometimes abuse their legal teams or the court system to try and get to the other party to teach them a lesson to show them you see i am suing you i told you i was going to sue you and now i'm suing you, you know so there's there's that sort of childish i'm going to get back at you thing sometimes you know and like i say i don't partake in it at all but i but i experience it often from from other sides and and to then decide how are we going to actually handle that yes it's very interesting y'all interesting also you don't want to build up a reputation as someone who bends the rules um yeah yes. i think you can actually it's it's not very good for your reputation. So just like you said, stay in your lane and just follow the rules. Yes. It's as simple as That's that. That's it. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And I um I recently made a very short little video for social media as well. Uh, and it's very random for me to do this about Formula One. <laughs> and there's that there's there's that next Netflix documentary about Formula One that has shed a lot of light on the sport for people such as myself that know absolutely nothing about it. And the philosophy in that sport as well is if you focus on on your own team and your own car and your own speed and, and you have to focus because you're going at a very high speed, you can do very well. As soon as you get distracted by the other people next to you, you can make a massive, massive accident. And it happens. It really happens. So to to not worry about whether they've gone and bent the rules or if they're rude or not rude or whatever. Just you've got more than enough here, right? Just in front of you with, with your client, for instance, or your client or um, the energy between the attorney and the advocate and whether that's gelling. That's more than enough to really keep you busy. There's no need to to go there. And, and, and clients expect that of, of you sometimes to say, why aren't you responding to this or that? They're being rude. And then I say to them, because it's not going to add anything to your case. In fact, I'm not a pet bull. That's something yes, I've heard a lot. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I'm not. I'm not. And, and this is something that took a very long time. You know, and it's now uh, eight years plus that I'm officially practicing. And when people initially meet someone with a, a sort of a calmer demeanor, their first the first response is, but you're not able to fight. I don't think you're a very good lawyer. <laughs> and then once you start explaining to them, but but wait a minute, this is a very technical field where, where knowledge and a calm demeanor is going to take you much further than an impulsive aggression. 
that's when the penny drops and they and once you start actually doing that this you actually practicing what you're preaching and they see it working then they start trusting you and they're like oh okay so it wasn't about flexing muscle and swearing at your opponent and doing these things that the movies and the series really try and portray for for a sense of drama it's not about that and but some people approach legal practice in that manner unfortunately it is true um but i i'm I'm a great um yeah i'm a great preacher of of staying a well-mannered uh, attorney or advocate that is kind and friendly to your to your um opponents i also hate that word but to your to your colleagues it's not necessary to to go that route you know so that's just my opinion about it yeah also after the case i mean you're still going to have to face them in court again so yes. exactly precisely so, mm, so do you want to perhaps tell us a bit more about that two points that you mentioned at the beginning that uh were in dispute yes uh those two technical points so yes. with the exception they obviously raised the exception um and they pointed out certain grounds or certain complaints as we as we call it that they said were were not aligned with what a labor related claim should be so they basically said here's your claim here's what it should be there's a gap between the two and this is our complaint and they raised several complaints um several it was like i think it was almost 10 or more to say this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong and therefore we are unable to respond to this claim and therefore the court must basically throw out the entire claim uh, and grant us our exception because you cannot properly formulate your claim so we cannot answer there too so in that regard the courts um the court which i really enjoyed about that judgment actually set out what a labor related claim such as this of this nature should entail at the very least and then said but wait a minute if we compare what we as the court feel is the very least to what you did then those two are aligned so what is the problem we don't understand what the problem is and the court very clearly also said but what it should not be is evidence you don't have to go into evidence in a statement of claim right because we 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 just put out our basic allegations we'll prove it later when it goes on to trial we'll use documents and verbal testimony but you as the claimant is not supposed to do those things now so if the respondent says i raise an exception where's your evidence then you re the respondent is wrong that doesn't happen now that happens much later so in a nutshell and it was a, it was a very well drafted judgment again it, that was the gist of what the court found is the court in a very um concise manner said what a statement of claim of this nature should be and what it should not be and then compared that to what we did what our client did and then said it's fine it's acceptable it meets the minimum criteria therefore the exception cannot succeed and therefore you should now answer there too because you're trying to not answer there too that's what you're really trying to do but answer there too because you can um and then they obviously answered there too and then it was a case of these you know they they deny this or they have a different version on certain things but th then only did they answer there too after the exception failed basically and then the other technical point is the su subpoena in terms of the client's tax returns what I liked about that judgment as well, very procedural as well, is the judge on the court said there are remedies that any party in a court case can use if they feel the other party owes them documents in terms of that case. But the very important thing is it must be relevant. I cannot sue someone and start asking for documents that are not related or relevant to that fight right just because we are now fighting in a court of law so relevance is is still the most important first hurdle in in law of law of evidence and so that was basically reasserted in that judgment which i thought was fantastic i thought it was a very important thing to be said and then after that 
the court said, but let's say the tax returns that you want to subpoena were relevant, which they're not, but let's say that they were. You have re remedies that you can use to get this party to give you those tax returns, such as you need to use this, this recovery in terms of the court rules, or you have to do this, or you have to do that, but you're not there yet. So why do you want to subpoena this person for documents that are irrelevant in the wrong way? You don't use a subpoena for this. You use the court rules that are in place at the right time to actually get these documents. So again, it was a very clear, uh, very clear stance from the court in terms of a procedural law point of view to say what the legal and court rules allow for when by whom and i think that was a very good and that that's maybe why the court felt both judgments were important enough so that others could look at them in that labor court going forward is to say as to sort of caution other parties to say you go back to the basics of law you go back to your law of evidence you go back to your court rules that apply in labor court as they do in the in the high court this is not a new ball game this is still the same ball game so why are we using subpoenas to try and get tax returns that are not relevant. Why are we doing that? We're not going to allow it here. So, yeah, so so both both judge, and I must say what also was striking, both judges gave the judgments quite quickly. It was less than 14 days, if I remember correctly. So it's not that they wondered about it. They just had to sit down and write the judgment and um, just reassert what the procedure in that court was and what parties could and and could not do. Yeah, basically that was, and, and um, yeah, I still look at those judgments. I still refer to them in other forums because our court rules are our court rules. They just have different numbers. So whether in the match court or in the high court, obviously it's, it's different court numbers and so on. But a lot of the things overlap. So whether in labor court or magistrate's court or high court, this is what you can use this process for, but you can never use it for certain other things. And, and those are important basics still. That's very interesting, and I think like the other the other side uh, or your opponents clearly knew that that was not the way to go, but they still chose to do it. Yes, that is very true, yeah. and that's something that is absolutely fascinating because they took the risk of of still going all the way with technical arguments that were not strong with to 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 actually start off with and. You know, there's a lot to be asked as to whether that was good or bad legal advice, because you, you, you raised a very important point earlier on to say reputation. And reputation is something that's built over time or broken over time. And if you do that enough as an attorney or, or an advocate and you give the wrong advice enough, people are going to start noting that. They're, gonna, they're going to say, oh, again, it's that firm or that attorney, whatever, that keeps on making the same mistakes because they want to intimidate or they want to try and abuse legal process. So, And the courts also realize who, who is who. You would be surprised as to how, how good the memories of these judges are. They're brilliant. And you appear in front of them maybe once or twice. The third time, they know who you are. They know your style. They know, you know your approach. And, and that subjective bias is there. They know, oh, it's that person that takes a chance every time. So you're not really doing... Your, your own reputation or your client at that particular point in time any favor by taking those chances when you know you cannot really do do, do well, that, that the legal basis aren't, aren't there. Yeah. That's very interesting. I don't know why they still chose to push on, but they did. And we went to court and argued it all the way out. It was an actual judgment on both, on both issues, yes. It's, it's quite fascinating. So... A question yes. that I received from one of my Facebook followers when I told them that I was going to interview you or have you on the podcast was what should they do if they are in a court case with their employer or previous employer or a CCMA case or something like that and they have a new employer or potential employer who wants to fund the previous employer for a reference. May that previous employer actually give a bad reference just because they are very angry at you for taking them that to is the a very that's actually an excellent practical question I must say so I think there are two two legal aspects that we sh that we should mention to try and give us our answer. The first thing is if there's pending litigation between two parties uh the term subjudica is not really 
that relevant in South South Africa post 1994, 1996, as it used to be. And, and actually, um, Professor Pierre de Vos on his blog at one point many years ago wrote a very interesting piece. I thought it was an excellent explanation on why sub judicate to say something is pending in law is not really relevant any longer. A lot of people hide behind it. They do not want to give answers. So you'll very often see on carte blanche or whatever, someone will say, I can't speak about it because it's sub judicate. And then I then I laugh because it's not really that relevant any longer. You can speak or interact about a case or about a party, even if it is pending. It becomes a bit more technical than that, but in but in general. So but that being said, there is to me a vested right or vested interest in a party that's in current pending litigation that cannot be overlooked. So how objective can a testimony or a reference from an existing employer be that is still litigating against that same employee? And in that sense, to say that it's still pending and no outcome is reached yet is relevant because we can't say it. Uh, you know, it's a big factual dispute. Employee is saying A, employer is saying B. For employer then to influence a future employer is horrible. So I would, as the employee, actually be proactive, to be honest. And I would contact whoever I apply to for work to disclose to them that I do have pen a pending matter at the CCMA. Not, to, not for them to label me or anything like that, but to say to them, if my employer that I'm litigating against contacts you, please know that it's not objective. Please know that I came to you proactively to inform you uh, that this is happening, which I think is a, a sign of, of then obviously honesty between employee and the new employer, which is always a very good thing, but also to warn them to take it with a very big pinch of salt because they have a vested interest in a pending litigation. So how, how objective could they possibly be? The other thing I want to say is this is something I'm using more and more in practice, and it's a very valuable tool, is to use interdicts. People that are, are engaging in actions that are, are damaging to others, whether it is abuse, whether it is defamation, whether it's stealing something, I don't know, it could be many things, but you, you actively partake in something that's causing another person or, or oh. entity harm. Yes. You must remember, you can interdict that person from doing that. So there's something such as an, a, a bona fide reference or testimony that could be exchanged between two employers, your past and your future employer. And then there's full-blown defamation where your previous employer is still mad at you because you still have this pending fight going on and they make sure you don't get employed anywhere else because they're going to contact everyone. And I've had, unfortunately, a similar case in the in the beauty industry not too long ago with something like this. And my first point of advice to most people is play open cards with your new employer or your the place that you apply to if they're not your employer yet and come forward first because they're going to tend to believe you if you are honest. If that doesn't work and or the damage is so great that really you are, you know, you've been you've been put in such a bad light, you cannot be employed again because of what this person then approach an attorney and consider some sort of an interdict process to have that stopped, which will obviously commence with a with a season desist letter, as the Americans like to refer to it, and then proceed to whether it be the harassment court or the high court for a restraining order there. But um, you cannot just sit back and have someone damage your life and not do anything. Um, so to to get a, a, an attorney's input in terms of what your chances of success are for foreign interdict is a very good idea to then see should we not take this further and stop that because I think um, I don't think an employer that's currently litigating against an employee can have the necessary credibility to give a reference or a testimony to a future employer, not until that isn't at least finalized. And even then, even maybe more so then, depending on the outcome. Um, at the same point, at, at the same time, I want to say to you, if a future employer, with due respect, doesn't have the savvy to distinguish the truth from, you know, maybe some some sour grapes then you know maybe that's not the your uh, future place of employment either so you must also be you must also see it as a lesson in terms of 
learning more about your future employer in the in the process to see how do they treat you already by the way that they receive maybe this reference from your previous employer that's also interesting you must partake in your own future you must you must uh, um, take in and observe and then assess what is it that you're seeing about this future employer do you even still want to work there you know so um it's a very long answer but so so just just to say between saying it's not objective and saying that it's subjudicated to an extent and between saying that you have remedies to interdict them from stopping if they're really trying to, to cause damage, I think there's a lot that you can do. But you will need the assistance of someone that has done similar work and, and has worked in the labor area to, to help you assess what is what. Is it serious enough? Do we leave it? Do we monitor it? You know, So those are things that someone that has done it before can definitely help with. Thank you so much for that answer. I think it um, helps a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> so my last question to you, Good. as this podcast is called Justice in Heels, I wanted to ask you, as a woman in law, have you ever been underestimated purely because you are female? Yes. Uh, one big renounding yes. <laughs> and then and then let us continue by actually qualifying that. Um. I think I should tell a quick story um, because it's it's true. And I think referring to stories gives credibility to a, sub, a subjective feeling because what's difficult about bias in general is people don't always take bias seriously because you, you can't prove it objectively, right? So then people say, you're being oversensitive or how do I know that what you're feeling is true because we can't measure it. So that's what makes bias in general extremely difficult. But I did vacation work quite early on when I studied and in 2011 we still consulted at the high court chambers in the Pretoria CBD before all those advocates moved out of town and we all had these beautiful chambers now all around the, the old and the new east of, of Pretoria and I was very excited because I'm now in, in this legal practice environment. I'm allowed to sit quietly in the corner and observe, which is a wonderful th thing to actually do if you've never been allowed in that space before. And in this particular consultation, there were five men and myself. It just ended up working out like that. It was myself, the person I was shadowing, um, other attorneys that were, you could say, on our side. There was more than one plaintiff and then a bunch of advocates. And I remember very clearly someone my age as well also a male doing vacation work and two things stood out from that meeting and those were important observations for me at a very early age the one is there was an assumption that I would that I would do the tea part of it I would definitely be the person that would handle the the, the tea and coffee and the nobody got up and you know the lady that brought the tea in very professional always at high court chambers maybe still is you know, did her job beautifully. And there was an assumption already in that moment that that would be my job. So um, there's something to be said for that experience, I think. And then the other thing that happened in that very same consultation is there was a discussion about a lady. Uh, it was not our client. It was the opposing party that, that would remarry and how the parties had to get divorced, taking into account that she would probably remarry at some point and then obviously get maintained by someone new in her life. And there, there, was a, there was a rating out of 10 that all the men around the table gave in respect of the lady's potential to remarry, specifically in regard to her looks. And to, I found it extremely shocking. And up to this day, that experience to me, that, the, just the blatant, overt manner in which that happened, whether I was there or not there. Look, I was probably the youngest person in the room as well, so I don't think I was much of a role player, but I'm a female. And they had no, they didn't think about it twice. There was, there was literally a rating and a bit of a banter about, you know, she's a beaut, and apparently she was beautiful. This is what I heard from what the, what the men said that day. But one gave a nine and a half out of 10, and that guy one gave the same out of 10. And, and that's how they, as a team of legal minds, decided on the ability and the potential to remarry and her ability and potential to be maintained by a future spouse. And to me, that was such a shocking experience and a, a disillusioning experience that day that was very important in my legal experience in general because I realized then and there, you're either going to accept that and work with it or you're going to be very bitter all the time in legal practice and be one of those female attorneys that many of our male colleagues refer to as 
she's rude, she's blunt, she's this, she's that. We, you know, we get called so, assertive. Yes. So, so now obviously I was not nearly as assertive as I am today. I'm still not assertive enough in certain contexts, but I obviously didn't say a word, but I observed and I, I took something from the day and the one thing I can really say to almost any female practicing attorney or advocate, especially if you're just starting your career, you're going to work double or triple as hard as the men. You will. I promise you. Because you're either going to have to network harder or you're going to have to research more to outsmart or you're going to have to do something where if they work on a task or an, a mandate for five hours, you're going to work on it for 10 to 15. If you do not want to accept that, don't go into the legal profession. Because if you are like me, and I'm very big on pride in general, personal pride, you will not want to stand back. You will want to, for the sake of your client as well, but also for your own name, you want to really have a fighting chance when you are representing someone. You want to be taken seriously. You want to be prepared. You want to be all these beautiful things. And to to get on the same level as a male colleague of exactly the same age as yourself, you're going to work double or triple as hard still. I know people say it's 2023 and I know people are going to say, what do I base that on? I base that on eight years in practice and the experience that I've had thus far. Yes, exactly. And the bias is there. You're always going to feel it, whether it's a little name or a little joke there or just not even being recognized in a group of people. You know, that's, that's why I'm saying it's difficult to measure these things, but those experiences are there. And you can speak to any female attorney or advocate. They will have exactly the same stories, if not more. And um, and to to recognize that it's there firstly, and then to say, how am I going to work with it? The way I handle it is just working double as as hard. And then whatever it takes, stuff, mm. whatever it takes, and that's it. And then your male colleagues, um, and of course there are wonderful male, male colleagues in the profession that have the utmost respect for me, and I know it, and I feel it, and I appreciate them very much. But the others, we're talking about the others, then also start taking you seriously. You're like, wait a minute, I didn't know that. This person is saying something I did not know. How is it that she knows something that I do not know? And so you you ensure respect, uh, healthy respect and just healthy recognition and validation because of the amount of work that you did behind the scenes to actually get into that space and to work double as hard. And again, going back to the Formula One example, the people that were not privileged and born into that world that have told their story is exactly the same thing. They had to work double, triple as hard because they weren't in that fast lane to start off with. So they had to start at the beginning, do the building blocks. Everyone frowned about it upon them a little bit. And now no one does anymore because they did really, really well or they keep on doing really well. So performance has a way to, I think is a very good counter for bias in general. If you can outperform people, um, uh, there's no way that they can still say you are lesser than. And to me, that's an extremely powerful tool. It's a very hard tool to use because it means you're going to be suffering most of the time. But it's rather that than just sitting back and complaining and saying, oh, well, you know, everyone's rude to me or I don't fit in. To me, that wasn't the way I just took up took up the job <laughs> and and do it you know what I'm saying so but yes and look I can talk to you for hours about this topic you know it's one story and one experience and to elaborate on that but hard work and outperforming people that doubt you in whichever capacity um is a wonderful tool you will you will get them fired and and it will work it will work every time I'm very sure of it so that's something that I can tell anyone and everyone that's possibly struggling with with feeling out of out of place a little bit. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And I love that you actually also gave some advice um, because right. it doesn't help like just uh, identifying the problems. We need to look for solutions. So thank you for that. Exactly. So and thank welcome. you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I, for one, enjoyed it so much. Um, Wonderful. I did you too. Just... Thank you very much. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Can you perhaps tell us where um, we can reach you or we, where we can learn more about your firm? Yes, of course. So um, my firm, I let Ace Attorneys, and it's incorporated as from last year. I'm still getting used to that. Is on Instagram. It's on Facebook. I am on LinkedIn in my personal capacity. 
and I very recently redid my entire website as well. Um, so I'm quite proud of the, the, the new visuals and the new materials on the website itself. I am quite responsive to emails in general. So new attorney, uh, new clients that wish to inquire in terms of consultations usually send me a first email and I try and, and get, get back to them as quickly as possible. So I'm um, lo located in Pretoria, but I ha literally have clients all over South Africa. I even have a few overseas, which is quite interesting. That's also quite an experience to me. So there's, there's very little work that I will say no to in principle. Um, and thank you very much. It was so lovely to actually speak with you and you've, you were so well prepared and these are really, really good questions. And it's good that you have this platform so others can hopefully get something from it as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Justice in Heels podcast. If you like this episode, we would love for you to share it with your friends on social media and tag us. As this is a legal podcast, here is a quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this podcast are solely the views of the individuals involved and not those of the firms, brands or anyone else that we are affiliated with.